Le David Mizmor, la Donai Haaretz Umloa, Tevel Vioshveva, Kihu al Yamim Yasada, Vial Nahorot Yhoneneha, Miya Ale Bahar Adonai, Umiya Kum Bim Kom Kacho, Niki Chapaim Muvar Levav, Asher Lonasa La Shav Nafshi Velonish Balamirma. The earth is the Lord's, with all of its fullness, the world is the Lord's with all of its inhabitants. Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in the holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. He will receive a blessing from the Lord and a just reward from the God of deliverance. I want to read a couple poems that uh, Norm had written. Because as, as his father did before him, Norm liked to write poetry. One is called A Long Road. It was written in 1959. I walk a long, long road, a road that stretches far. It curves and twists along the way and leads up to a star. Sometimes I walk the road alone, sometimes with others near. Sometimes a smile is on my face, sometimes it has a tear. The road is hard to walk on. It's filled with grief and strife. Yet I still go on to reach that star, for it is the road of life. Another poem called The Cycle was written in 1962. From joy to sorrow, sorrow to joy, the cycle never ends. Just when the tree is growing strong, clouds, a storm, it bends. Hopes and dreams fall to the ground, are carried by the breeze and come to rest a long way off in some other trees. But just when grief is at its height, a beam of light breaks through and shines and spreads its soothing warmth to where those dreams once grew. The dreams regrow, the hopes revive, the tree of life unbends, and joy again is in the heart, but the cycle never ends. He was a wonderful man. He was a kind and a sweet and a decent man. Do I have to tell you this? You know this already. Many of you could say the exact same words. And Toby, that was your husband's true decency, that everyone could say those words. Not flashy, but with a twinkle in his eye. A man of numbers and statistics, but with an instinct for poetry and a sense of humor and very, very reliable, very responsible. You know what, I've heard a lot during these past 24 hours about uh, polls and estimates and surveys and statistics and sometimes how undependable they are. 
And I thought of Norm because Norm should have been doing the polling. He would have been much more accurate. Because Norm was accurate. Norm strove to be accurate because he knew people depended on him. And he wanted to live up to that. Toby, you depended on him. And your children depended on him. And his workplace depended on him. He majored in math. He loved math. He worked with math. And I know in his early interactions with you, Toby, he tried to impress upon you a very simple mathematical equation. One plus one equals two. He wanted to marry you right away. And he wanted that equation to work for you. He wanted to marry you. You take a little longer at math than Norm does. So it took you a little longer. I know a friend suggested during that period that you write up a list of pros and cons. And you said you couldn't because you couldn't up come up with anybody, anything on the con side. And that's when you knew. And so, of course, you said yes, and you two were truly devoted and immersed in each other's lives. And what you admired in him, what you saw in him, was a man who would follow through. People promise all the time. Lots of people promise things. Will they follow through? And you knew that Norm would follow through. And he did so in his own kind and sensitive way. He endeared himself to your family. He endeared himself with his honesty. And with a word that sounds old-fashioned, but it's really very much your husband. It's a word stronger than decency. It's honor. He was an honorable man. He was a man of honor. Following through on your commitments to people, that's a badge of honor. Being there when you're needed, moving through life with humility, doing the right thing, that is a badge of honor. And that was Norm Bresky. He was a man who worked with details, whether he was working with statistics or in terms of quality control, whether he was working with computers, whether he was touring the plants, working in the steel area, whether he was teaching college students, whether he was working in the community. Norm was comfortable and immersed in details, but he was even more meticulous when it came to people. He never let numbers and statistics get in the way of people. He was no isolated ivory tower figure. He was most drawn to details when it had to do with somebody's life. And that's why he valued education. That's why he never met a school levy he didn't like. That's why he advocated for funds for special needs classes. When Andrea was younger, he felt he could assist in the teaching of math in her school, so he gave his time. He went into the classroom, made it fun, made it instructive for kids. Whether at LTV or Swage Lock, his approach to quality control was not strong on the control, it was strong on the quality. He never wanted to sacrifice the quality. He cared for the worker, and he co-authored a book to guide them in their work. People were not a tangent for him. People were his main priority. And of course, he became an usher, then the head of the usher committee at the synagogue because he cared for the individual. He wanted to create a certain atmosphere for the individual congregant. He was special that way. He recognized that we needed at that time to transition some of those ushers out of the Yosef Stalin approach and into a different approach. <laughs> Toby, you met him and you knew his heart right away. And you knew his mind. But how could you know, how could anyone know, how their partner would follow through for people? How did you know that he and you would work together in being pioneers in the areas of special needs, inclusion in the community, in being supportive of each other and of other families, at a time when there was much less awareness in this area, when you both had to deal with a lot of blank stares, with a lot of resistance, with a lot of impatience, or just with a lot of plain ignorance? How did you know? How could you know that Yours would be a true egalitarian partnership before egalitarian became such a household word. You two acted like a unit, a loving, resourceful, committed, and amiable unit. I'll tell you what you did, Toby. You married a Boy Scout. And I mean that on a couple levels, as you know. He had the character and the characteristics of the Boy Scout model. And of course, he also worked on behalf of the organization, brought Ben into it as well. 
whether in that group or others, he believed in community building, on one-on-one -on -one relationships, and he believed in hard work performed with a pleasant disposition. That's a very rare combination. There are nice guys who get nothing done, and there are result-oriented people who you can't stand to be around. And you had the best of both. Norm had been close, of course, with his own parents. And not so long ago, we were speaking about Norm's father's poetry, just in the same way that he's wrote, he wrote poetry that I read today. And I want to make give my condolences to Bobby, of course, on her loss. Andrea and Ben and Jill, your dad was always there for you. Teaching was simply part of his instinct, part of his nature, guiding you gently and ultimately representing in his actions the values you would want to emulate. You knew he cared. He was there for you as, your, as you pursued your interests, and you certainly knew the interests that he had and some interests that he didn't have. As I said, interests he had, he loved the Boy Scouts, he loved Broadway music and show tunes. He had been in a marching band at one time. He wrote the poetry that he loved, and he loved being involved in the synagogue and the prayer book committee. He just loved going to shul. But you also knew what he had no interest in. He had no interest in gossip. He had no interest in talking down about anyone. He had no interest in embarrassing anyone. He had no interest in divisiveness or burning bridges. Norm had friends of every political point of view. He was the only Jew at LTV. He knew how to get along with a sacri without sacrificing anything of his own, of, of his own beliefs. And Toby, you created around you the most wonderful group of friends at Park Synagogue. From the time I arrived, these group of friends were central to the community feeling at Park and, of course, central to your own life. Your children learned about Park not from the monthly bulletin, but from the faces of your good friends who you experienced Jewish life with. And I can say this with certainty because I see the faces out here. These friends are ready to stand with you now. They're ready to sit with you, and they're ready to sit by you, and they're ready to do for you. That's what Shiva is. But in this case, Shiva represents the love and care that your wonderful friends will have for you beyond this first week. Norm tried to live as long as he can. But the amount of time he was given, he lived with honor. He lived with a good name, and he died with a good name. Andrea, I think you have words to, are you sharing some words with us today? Yes. So we're going to do first the uh, cousin, um, Norm's niece, who sent me a statement. His niece, Ellen. Uncle Norman. Unc, what can I say? It's hard to believe that you have left this world. On the one hand, I acknowledge that it's your time. Why prolong your remaining in this world when you're not really living like you want? Yet you are too young to die. You are too young to have a debilitating illness. It's not fair. Ben sent me several poems you wrote. When you were 18, you wrote a poem titled In Memory as a result of your 11-year-old cousin's death from cystic fibrosis. You have some thought-provoking suggestions to our creator regarding illness. As long as I've known you, you've accepted what you got and managed with a smile. I remember the day you married Aunt Toby at the Poel 8 Sedek Recreation Hall. I was jealous that you were getting my best friend aunt and was worried that you wouldn't share her with me. I called Grandma Lily the day after the wedding and asked where Aunt Toby was, as I was so used to her being accessible to me. Happily, I discovered that I didn't lose my aunt, yet I inherited a remarkable uncle who paid a lot of attention to his nieces and nephews. You used to play basketball with me. Do you remember when I tossed the ball into the garage window? We watched it shatter. You were not angry at all and told me it was no big deal. My children and their friends often spent summers with you before and after camp, as well as one summer when I was ill. You treated them as if they were your own. My kids and their friends reminisce to this day 
about the great times they had with Uncle Norman. I often called you when I had problems. You talked me through them and everything would be okay. You were always available to advise or just schmooze. Thank you. I have fond memories of the many satyrs spent in your home. Yes, we were in your home, yet you always gave the honor of leading the satyrs to my father of blessed memory. We always felt so welcome to stay with you. When you came to Israel, you tried to squeeze in as much as possible. I had the privilege of hosting you several times in my home in Jerusalem. You appreciated every little thing, be it a meal or even a glass of juice. The last time you were here, Ben got the honor of having you stay with him, and you all enjoyed every minute. I watched how Jill mimicked your every move, the way you wore your hat, your saunter, your body motion. You will be sorely missed by those who had the honor to know you and your goodness. I am hopeful that you and my father of blessed memory will meet up in the world to come. Please watch over and protect us. I ask for your forgiveness for anything I may have done to hurt you intentionally or unintentionally. Your niece, Ellen Berkman Amzalot. And now we'll have Ben. I'd just like to thank everyone for coming and thank Rabbi Scoff and everyone from the synagogue and, um, and uh, thank you. So I'm going to read on behalf of Ben. In my father's dresser drawer there is a small flashlight which he used to use every morning to dress and get ready for work so he wouldn't have to turn on the light and disturb my mother. He would wake up early to drive downtown for work. We would always wait for him to come home for dinner and have dinner together as a family. My father took pride in caring for the lawn and I have many memories of helping him plant flowers and trim the hedges. I would help him clean, mow the lawn, rake the leaves, go to the hardware store. He always seemed to find an age-appropriate job for me to help out. On several occasions, he would fix my toys if they broke downstairs in the workroom. He taught me to use tools, and I worked on school assignments together with him. For Cub Scouts, together we built a wooden race car for the Pinewood Derby. Dan glued metal, Dad glued metal washers to the bottom front of the car so that it would have more weight as it rolled down the track. When our car was significantly faster than others, we were told this disqualified the car. We had to remove them. Old Norm, I'll tell you, my father. The guy you never suspect. My father, my father always participated in Cub Scout and Boy Scout functions with me. We went on many camping trips together. Once we did rappelling. I volunteered to be the first one to go down. My dad said, now he's willing to jump off a cliff, but I have to coax him to climb the ladder to clean the gutters. My dad always encouraged me to help out, and when I didn't want to, he let me play the music of my choice during the task. Even if this music was rap or metal, he never complained. In the car, he allowed me to play for him without negative comment. Whatever new music I had discovered, he would usually simply say, nice guitar work or interesting lyrics. I was proud to take him to the radio station and broadcast together with him as my co-host. He was willing to take the long bus ride to the station and join me. The most recent time, I arranged us to interview an award-winning Broadway show. I was proud that I could get to him. I was proud that I could get him to talk to a composer he really respected. And it was a special treat for the two of us to share. On the times I had my dad co-host with me, a fan would write in and ask who that really professional sounding voice was. Did we finally hire a real radio announcer? 
Dad took me to baseball games, and I'm glad he saw the Cavs finally win the championships and the Indians make it to Game 7 in the finals. He drove us down to the stadium and the Coliseum and Jacobs Field, and we saw the Force and the Cavs and the Indians. We used to play catch in the backyard. One day in first grade, I was upset because I did not know the rules for kickball, and the other kids did seem to know. My father drew on the chalkboard the baseball field and explained all the rules to me. Then he explained football, basketball, and soccer, drawing each of their fields and telling me how many players and so forth. He also taught me chess. I have fond memories of going to Simchat Torah at Park Synagogue and marching around the synagogue with the Torah, a larger one for him and a smaller one for me. He grew up in a reform synagogue, but made a concerted effort to learn the prayers. We consistently went to services. Once on Yom Kippur, we stayed all day straight through the evening services. When I was little and could not read Hebrew, he advised me to pick out all the letters I could recognize. My dad taught me to tie a tie, and once during graduation ceremony, I ended up teaching others to tie their tie. He taught me to drive and how to shave. Once, when we went to the car wash, he said, did you take a bath today? If not, just get out, and after they wash the car, they can hose you down and wash you too. When I had my appendix taken out, my father picked me up from school in the middle of the day and drove me to the hospital. In Menorah Park, he still retained his sense of humor. My mother took him to all the events and activities. Once after my dad retired and taught at Case Western Reserve University, I visited him. I was proud to see Professor Bresky on the door. A student came by to ask him about an exam. As I sat in the other room, I heard my father calmly explain to the student why his grade was lower than expected and then explain which problems he got wrong and why and tell him how he could improve. He always wanted me to succeed in my career and inquired about my dating life. For a guy that never had an opportunity for a, a serious religious upbringing, he always made sure to buy a lulav and etrog for Sukkot every year. We built a sukkah together. This was before a prefab metal frame sukkah really was available. He cut the wooden beams to the right length and we climbed up on the ladder to build it. We slept in the sukkah. Today I recognize that the same group of friends my parents had from my childhood are still their friends today. I got picked up from the airport and another family friend picked up Andrea from the airport. People came to visit Menorah Park. People have been calling and sending food and offering to help. The staff at Menorah Park and Park Synagogue and Rabbi Scoff and everyone has all been supportive. One of the nurses at Menorah Park told me she had never seen a couple so dedicated to each other. He taught me by example how to be a good husband, father, grandfather, worker, etc. I'm thankful to God for the opportunity to be a son and have such a wonderful father, and I hope I have been a good one and will apply all the life lessons I learned. Ben, that was beautiful. Thank you so much. Really beautiful. So I think the first thing you have to know about dad is that Ben and I had the same childhood, um, which not all brothers and sisters could say, actually. Um, and Jill had the same childhood, which not all people with our family configuration can say. So I'll drop some of the things that are total repeats, <laughs> if I can remember to drop them. <laughs> so my dad, my dad was a dad. He told dad jokes. He got up at 6 a.m. on a Sunday morning dressed in the dorky cycling clothes and announced that we were all missing the best part of the day. He would get up and shower and read the whole newspaper every morning. When the steel industry in Cleveland was going um, down, he claimed that he was checking to see if he still had a job. He went to work with a hard hat in his trunk to visit the steel plants, came home, and after we ran out and greeted him in that driveway, he went upstairs to change out of the jacket and the tie and the dress shoes downstairs for dinner on time. He made one of my high school male friends so nervous watching him back out of our driveway, the poor guy ran over our lawn three times. Classic dad move. 
He also washed the dishes and he knew all our friends by name and gave dating advice, apparently even to my brother, um, and was in the schools for every meeting and every conference and to teach my classmates statistics and show that little movie on how steel was made. Everybody loved him and I don't remember ever feeling embarrassed. He was, cool. he was a cool nerd before nerds were cool. There was a joke in our house that if you pulled out, say, a warped greenish potato chip from the bag or two cookies that were fused together or the zipper didn't zip back closed again on the zipper pack, one of us would yell out, quality control or ISO 9000. Dad was a certified auditor and a quality assurance manager in addition to a senior statistician at LTV Steel downtown, J&L before that. He traveled all over the small towns of Ohio and to Pennsylvania and Illinois, making sure processes and products were up to par. He started the quality control joke, and it worked two ways. One was that in his business, there was an acceptable margin of error. And when you got one oopsie in the potato chip bag, that was just part of everyone doing their job best they could, and you still got your chips. Someone at that plant was doing the equivalent of dad's job, and he empathized with them. He was like that outside of work too. Kind, forgiving, generous. He didn't even badmouth nameless people in a factory, let alone people we knew. People felt that and they wanted to work on committees with him or be taught by him. We kids felt it, our friends felt it. The guy who drove over our lawn, dad was so horrified to discover he thought he had been watching him critically from the window instead of to protect him because our driveway is really hard to get out of, that he spent years afterwards just randomly in conversation saying, I like him. He and my mom showed us what a loving partnership is in a marriage. They had private jokes and gentle touches, but they publicly helped each other out in the house and in the community, trading off their strengths. They compromised so we could take family vacations, even though you heard dad was a boy scout. He taught me how to build a one-match fire, and Mom said that it was camping if there wasn't air conditioning in the cabin in Ohio. <laughs> and it's already been mentioned, but I'll say it again, because they had the same friends forever. And I knew you guys as units by your last names. And my parents acted as a unit that way, too. You're here now. You've been there. My wedding and the births of my children, and every time I came home. But he also took in my husband, John, and all the in-laws, and every friend I ever brought through the doors, opening the circle ever wider. And he was also kind with himself. If he got lost driving, he joked that he was taking the scenic route. We passed Arlington Cemetery in DC a few times before he got the hang of the rotary there. And he'd have us wave out the window at the soldiers' graves saying, yep, they're still there. Then there was the other side to quality control. Dad really did like things done right, and he liked them done well. Math was math, and he was precise with it. He worked to improve things everywhere he went. When he didn't like how math was taught in our schools, and that was a magnet school that was cutting edge at the time, he came in with his abacus and his statistical model machines and the movie on how steel was made. When he did like how it was taught in my kids' school at JCDS in Boston, he still came in and he loved being able to work with a higher and more supported level. He fought for more money for the schools and for a better system of funding. He taught us to campaign for local candidates to know who they were and what they did and how government worked. He fought side by side with mom for programming and education for Jill. Mom was famously the loud one, but he was busy preparing those documents to back her up every step of the way. And he taught me how to swim and ride a bike and mow a lawn and drive a car and use a computer and shoot basketball hoops without breaking the garage window and get a Frisbee off the neighbor's roof and weasel mom into letting us have a pet, pet cat and choose and set up a stereo system and build dinosaur models and dollhouse furniture and pretty much every life skill except cooking. He was precise in his Judaism. He didn't spend a lot of time talking about God. What he did was attend Minion. He researched and worked for years choosing the right new prayer books for Park. He entered adult Hebrew classes and he struggled through unfamiliar prayers so that year by year 
He became more and more skilled at our Shabbat table, even while we teased him about his old man Ashkenazi pronunciations. We had an incredible Torah reader at Park, my teacher, Reverend Levy, and he was a lot like Dad, always there, always accurate, but a gentle and clever teacher. This Friday night, I sat with my dad and I was practicing Torah, Lech Lecha. He couldn't respond to much, but as soon as I started chanting, he became extremely responsive. So we practiced for a long time and I started translating for him, alternating between chanting and reading the story of how Avram says to his nephew Lot, Al Natahi Mariva, please let's not have strife, for we are brothers. Is not the whole land before us? If you go left, I'll go right. If you go right, I'll go left. I haven't learned the words to a Torah reading that carefully in a long time. It's easy to get caught up in the rush and just get a job done, especially when someone calls from Minion and says, we need you. It's easy to do a good enough job and most people won't know the difference. But if you ever read at Park, Rev Lev knew. And for my dad, even if you happen to be the best one in the room, you knew if you hadn't done your best. You owed people the right way, or at least the best reasonably possible way of doing things. So as recently as this Shabbat, my dad taught me Torah. To me, quality control means you can always do better, and you can make entire systems better. You can pursue excellence, you can learn new things, you can contribute. And none of those things need to be harsh. You can be excellent and precise and mathematical and funny and loving and accepting and kind. When I first started going into my kids' classrooms for storytelling, I experienced what my dad did when he came into our classrooms for math. It's an incredible honor to have your children welcome you into their learning space and to trust you with their classmates and their friends. I thought of dad wondering if he was nervous too wondering at the ease at which he seemed to become our teacher while being our dad. When I started teaching Miriam how to drive, I kept thinking, I can't do this. Someone else needs to do this. I tried to foist it off on my husband because some real parent needs to do this. But it was because of my dad's teaching that I was able to drive from Boston to Cleveland every year. And after a while, I understood what he was doing with those Shabbos prayers. He was getting better and better and more and more confident. And now I enjoy the trip and I get to show my kids Niagara Falls and Binghamton and Ithaca. So I imagined my dad was teaching Miriam, giving that freedom into the next generation. I'm not as gentle as my father, and I don't understand numbers and math like he did. But I hope to keep growing in my ability to do quality control with precision and grace and I hope to be able to carry on the legacy he gave me just now, even when he couldn't any longer speak it. Please let's not have strife, for we are all brothers. Thanks, Dad. Let's rise now for the memorial prayer. Ha <laughs> 
В януах бешало мало мішка веномар. May we all remember the worthy and the righteous deeds that he performed in the land of the living. God is now his portion. May he rest in peace, and we all say amen. Let's be seated. We want to offer our condolences to the family, to Toby, to Andrea, Jill, and Benjamin, to John, to the grandchildren, Miriam, Bela, Anna, Josie, Richie, and Shira, and to sister Bobby, Roberta, and her husband Robert. The family will be receiving visitors as they observe the week of Shiva at the family residence in University Heights. The address is 2485 Charney Road, 2485 Charney Road in University Heights for the week of Shiva. Uh, we're going to pause in the uh, service at this time to arrange processional to move to the burial spot where we will complete the service. Please remain in your seats for another moment or two. The pallbearers, however, should now come forward. 